Hey there, this is Dan, and you're watching an emergency edition of the Salty Sea. For those who don't know, a lot of Warcry was just removed from the game, and so I'm here to talk about what that means for our favorite game, our favorite skirmish game, and uh, what to think about the game going forward. Let's start with just the news. Beasts of Chaos were moved to the Old World. Sacrosanct and Bone Splitters were yeeted from the game. Uh, somehow Vanguard Chamber survived. I don't know why. All first edition Warcry Warbands were removed from production. Now, we're not just talking about the Old World. So, for example, Beasts of Chaos, they said very much what would happen, right? They were going to the Old World. Bone Splitters were told that they would be put into Legends, and essentially you can play them until 2025, which is interesting that you get one year with your toys. Um, so they are saying straight up removing the Warcry Warbands from the range, uh, which is pretty intense. They will get Legends roll War Scrolls, so again, you can play them in AOS for a year. Uh, that's how long the current edition of Warcry is lasting, probably a year and three months. Uh, so you'll get a little over a year with them. But they are removed, not just from Age of Sigmar, but from all of production. Uh, and then Horns of Hashut somehow ended up in there as well, uh, which is pretty funny given that they're in 2nd edition Warcry. Uh, Chaos Legion survives, Darko Savagers survive, and Knight Shadowstalkers all survive. Uh, that's going to be very important moving forward as we kind of try to figure out what this means for us. Let's take a look at first the answerable questions. Uh, is this a dead game death knell for Warcry? No, right? Uh, a few different things here. First, I mean, look at the direction of the game. It's gotten so much more model support lately than it ever has before. Pace of the new releases is intense and interesting, and there is clearly a ton of effort being put into the rules that things are getting. The fact that white dwarves are including massive rules dumps, right? The current White Dwarf that is coming out in about a week has a massive rules dump for Warcry where they've got new battle plan generators, new rules for Underworld's Warbands in Warcry. They would not be doing all that work if they didn't plan to continue supporting Warcry going forward. Do I have issues with how they support Warcry? Yes, of course I do. I don't like that they keep giving us new battle plan generators, but they can't just buff 20 fighters and nerf 20 fighters so that we can have, you know, a healthier competitive game. But um, the, the fact is they are supporting the game in the way that they think is appropriate. Uh, just because they're wrong about what's appropriate doesn't mean that we have a dead game, right? We have a very live game that a lot of people play and that GW has shown that they're committed to a enabling us to play it for a very long time. The next one, will these first edition warbands still be in Warcry 3? Now, I can't tell you that for sure, but signs point to no, because they're being removed not just from AOS, but from the range, which is uh, like, they won't even be for sale anymore. You won't be able to get them. If they are in Warcry 3, that is actually a bad thing. You do not want these to be in Warcry 3 because if any of them are good, like let's say for Warcry 3, there's a points update. And so certain fighters, you know, like a lot of things go up in points. All of a sudden, all of the things that you can't get anymore that aren't being updated anymore would be the best things in the game. And so then competitively, if you ever went to a tournament, you would just get ranched by anyone bringing like iron golems or something and that's just not a good place for the game to be in so you don't want these in warcry 3 now that they're not in the range anymore uh if like it's this weird thing where if they're not in warcry 3 a lot of people will be disappointed but if they are in warcry 3 that means we have a dead game right that means we have a game where war where they are legitimately telling us that they do not want us to have events for that game. Uh, we already have a very sticky sort of limbo situation with what to do with old Bladeborns that are on the old algorithm that are way more powerful than anything that's currently in the game. Um, and that's not a great place for us to be in competitive events right now. Uh, the fact that it's sort of the norm to include them is pretty wild to me. But 
<laughs> that's kind of a separate issue. And that issue, I think, describes why we aren't going to have them in Warcry 3. So you should just come to terms with the grief that you need to process to deal with that. Um, I think I'll probably try to take Iron Golems to a tournament at some point in the next year. Uh, I just spent, you know, two months, three months uh, playing Scions of the Flame uh, essentially nonstop. Uh, I will be still putting out a video about everything you ever wanted to know about Scions of the Flame, uh, even though you'll only be able to play them for a year and a quarter. Uh, that's just kind of how it is. Uh, it will be interesting if there's a Legends equivalent in th Warcry 3rd Edition. There could be something like that where they give you War Scrolls. I don't know how much the game will change for 3rd Edition. Uh, that kind of remains to be seen. But you should definitely come to terms with the fact that these aren't going to be... You know, they'll, they'll still be around for the rest of 2nd Edition, of course, even though they won't be purchasable anymore. Um, you'll still be able to play them for as long as second edition exists but uh you should you should process the fact that they're not going to be in third uh another answerable question uh somewhat answerable so it's really interesting to me that darko savagers and chaos legionnaires survive from the slaves to darkness range and i think this opens up a lot of questions about what to expect for war crime the first you know like what does it mean does it mean that every faction is allowed to have two bespokes I think that would be a pretty decent general rule of thumb, right? Where any more than two and you start to get really crowded, really bloated, really confused, um, but two just seems very manageable. Or does it mean that they're just only going to keep bespokes around that are tie-ins with specific AOS sub-factions or current lore? Like they made a very, um, what would you say, a uh, revealing comment about how Dark Oath is now the defining flavor of sort of non-blessed mortals uh, in Chaos Undivided, right? Like you have your big Chaos Warrior types that are super armored, um, but then for just regular people, Dark Oath is now the default for that. And so lore-wise, Dark Oath Savagers just fit with where they're going in the lore. It it's interesting because model-wise, they seem more obsolete than the other Chaos Warbands do, right? Because model-wise, they're taking everything that they've done in Dark of Savagers, everything that Glory Seekers look like, that's essentially what the new Marauders are. You will not be able to tell the difference between a Dark of Savagers Glory Seeker and a new Marauder, uh, which is a really interesting place to be as far as why they would then keep Darko Savagers. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's a clear showing because Chaos Legionnaires are also part of the lore for one of the important sub-factions of Slaves to Darkness, right? Uh, you have your Archaeons, you have your Bellicors, and you have your regular people on the bottom. And it seems like this kind of triangle of what Slaves to Darkness is right now. And Chaos Legion is the Bellicor side, right? So you could easily see a Warcry Warband that then leans to the Archaeon side and just have three, and there's three Warcry Warbands, one for each subsection of Slaves to Darkness, something like that. Um, and so that would break the two bespokes per faction thing, but would still make a lot of narrative sense. And I'm leaning towards assuming that that is going to be the case, is that they are going to be keeping long-term any Warcry Warband that fits narratively with what the core of a faction is, which is interesting because Warcry really started um, as sort of them spitballing what was out there. And so they've created a lot of different types of Warcry, of Warcry Warbands. And so I think when we look at the ones that weren't squatted, it's worth thinking about sort of which ones are safe long-term, which ones fit into this paradigm. And warbands that are just AOS units seem perfectly safe for a very long time. So things like Gorger Maw Pack, things like Hunters of Huanchi, um, they seem like they will be safe for the foreseeable future. I mean, the fact that ogres weren't squatted in this edition um, it would have been pretty shocking if they were, but it could have been possible because all those models are incredibly old. But the fact that they weren't squatted, I think, means that an ogre refresh is coming. 
maybe not in the next year, maybe not even in the next two years, but it's clearly part of their plan. There will be a big refresh, and Gorger Mall Pack is going to be part of that and is going to just be what the Gorgers are for ogres. And so you're very safe keeping them. Uh, same with Hunters of Huanchi. Chameleon Skinks have been a part of Seraphon forever. The Seraphon range refresh didn't include Chameleon Skinks because they had them in Hunters of Huanchi, and that will be the way they do Chameleon Skinks forever. You can buy that warband and know that it's never going to be a problem. The other thing that I think seem safe for a long time are warbands that perform important lore functions. Uh, so, for example, Chaos Legionnaires, I just talked about being the Bellicor human, the Bellicor blessed human. So a step above Dark Oath, but uh, still humans and tied to Bellicor. Knight Shadow Stalkers being sort of the very important secret agents of Marathi that have played a role in a whole bunch of different lore situations for AOS. Um, these make sense. I can't necessarily guarantee like which ones fit that bill i think that will be up to you know your own judgment so for example our quester soul sworn lore important i would lean no but i could see pretty good arguments for saying yes um so you could kind of go a few different directions same with like royal beast flayers they're kind of just a collection of flesh eater courts but they do at least kind of fit with the current lore of Flesh Eater Courts, and they have um, sort of a role, not necessarily, I don't know if they're any good in the army mechanically right now, but they have a role in terms of um, talking about, you know, fancy people going on trips, essentially. If that's the case, which are the warbands that I wouldn't feel terribly safe about? Uh, the ones that are kind of out of left field. Again, like, you could argue whether Royal Beast Flayers belong in this category or belong in the previous one. Uh, but things like Rottmeyer Creed, unfortunately, things like Jade Obelisk. Um, for example, Claws of Karanak definitely go in this important lore function setting, right? Karanak is an important corn character who has been around a long time. Uh, dogs have always been an important corn sub motif. I would be shocked if Claws of Karanak ever got squatted. But Rottmeyer Creed are just a group of doctors that got hoodwinked by Nurgle once and sent out into a swamp. <laughs> they could get squatted at any moment, right? Um, Jade Obelisk are really cool. I mean, they're lore-wise, they're one of my favorite factions in all of Warcry. Um, but they are like a separate nation that is completely separate from everything Zinch is ever done and has never come up in Zinch's story. There's never been any kind of lore that is like Zinch is super excited that that one Lord of Change saved the Jade Obelisk people because now he's going to use them to do something, right? That's never, that's never happened. Um, so those are the ones that I would feel pretty unsafe about. Now, what does unsafe mean in this context? That's tough to say, right? Because if they're safe in AOS 4, they're definitely safe in Warcry 3. So you have a pretty good guarantee that you can play these factions for the next four years. And if that's good enough for you, that should be fine, right? Um, but the question really for me is, what does it look like when we have multiple warbands per faction? So for example, at our current pace, we will finish off every single faction of the game before Warcry 3.0 comes out. Now, they might pause a little bit. I think there's a very good chance that they slow down their release pace for um, the final year of Warcry 2.0. I doubt we'll get every single faction, but we have most of them right now, right? So this kind of begs the question of what do future releases actually look like? The first is like for 1.0, is Warcry where you spitball ideas? Is it like Claws of Karanak feel incredibly important to what Warcry is, but then, or like what Corn is, but then Rottmeyer Creed ends up feeling a little bit superfluous in Nurgle. If that's the case, do we expect this one in four hit rate to continue? Uh, if so, that's really disastrous for like wanting to purchase Warcry Warbands. It means, you know, the life cycle of a Warcry Warband is 
whatever the distance between now and the next edition of AOS is plus three years, right? Uh, which is not great. Um, so, you know, no, like three out of four Warcry Warbands are essentially squatted within four to six years. And then one out of four gets to live forever, right? I wouldn't love that situation, but that's something that we really do need clarification on. They would never tell us that outright, but I could very much see them talking about, you know, in an article sometime or in an interview sometime, like what they see as the design constraints for Warcraft or, or, you know, things like that, that would let us read between the lines to figure out what they mean here. The other option is if Warcry is not necessarily the spitballing place, which it clearly was in 1.0, even in 1.0, they said, this is our opportunity to talk about what kinds of humans are in the realms uh, and create little sub factions that we could never make an army for. And then, you know, what we now know is that all those sub factions were essentially a tryout for what was going to be the face of um, humans in the future of Age of Sigmar, uh, Chaos Humans. Uh, I'm sad that Corvus Cabal didn't win, but what can you do? Um, the next then, if it's not for spitballing ideas, is it cyclical or is it factional? And this isn't necessarily mutually exclusive with it as an area to spitball ideas. Um, so for example, if Warcry is essentially not for spitballing ideas and it is factional, uh, would new releases of Warcry Warbands almost exclusively be just like AOS units? The way like Kill Team, every once in a while, there will be a Kill Team that is something that is its own new special snowflake. But for the most part, most Kill Team Warbands are essentially just 40k units that have been... Uh, sort of zhuzhed up a little bit for the purposes of Kill Team. Uh, some of them have like little bits of equipment that you can't get anywhere else. Um, there's a jump pack uh, Space Dwarf, for example, that you can't get anywhere else. Nowhere else in the Space Dwarf range has that, and so it's this cool little oddity, things like that. But it would be just like fancy versions of AOS units. That's not a future I hate, but it is a future that is less cool than maybe what I thought Warcry's future was. Um, the next one, though, is will new releases be like expansions on existing Warcry factions? Because there's only so many we can have per army. And if they've already admitted, like, we're not interested in any factions that don't fit the lore of, like, the current direction of the lore of the army that they're tied to, um, that becomes, let's say we get into Warcry 3.0, and it's time to make a new Nurgle Warband. Is it going to be like Necromunda, where they will expand factions all the time? Like, will we get, uh, instead of the Rotmire Creed, I thought I could do a clever, I don't know enough Christian bands to be able to do, like, whatever the Rotmire other band is. Maybe, <laughs> maybe like, Rotmire Rolling Stones, because we had Rotmire Creed first, something like that. Or, um, you know, we had Jade Obelisk, now it's like the Jade Walkway. And they'll be the same sort of sub-faction, but just expanded, something like that. Necromunda does that. Again, this is a future that isn't necessarily what I thought Warcry might be yesterday, but is a valid way to do it. Um, but I don't think that you could do both of those options, right? I don't think you could take the Kill Team model and the Necromunda model and necessarily put them in a blender very easily. Um, I mean, I guess you could if you wanted to, but I would be very doubtful that we would see that. Uh, the most important thing, though, is are new releases going to yeet the previous release from the game? Because if that is the case, I just don't see Warcry being playable long term, if I'm being honest. Um, and so I really deeply hope that that's not the case. I hope that most of these warbands can live for a very long time. Uh, but if we continually get mass removals from the range for everything, um, that's a really bad situation to be in. I think there are reasons to think that this is a one-time thing and that 
you know, Warcry essentially showed up as the chaos versus chaos game, uh, everything chaos all the time. And second edition showed that they very much no longer wanted to be that, that they wanted to be essentially a sub game of the full AOS experience. And so it's not crazy to me that the pieces from when Warcry was Chaos v. Chaos was its own, like back when Warcry was a tiny specialist game, uh, you know, because the original edition of Warcry had more in common with Blood Bowl than it did with what Warcry currently is, you know, in a lot of ways. Obviously, mechanically, no, but like in terms of where it's positioned and its its place in in the wider ecosystem, um, you know, like it has more in common with that little gore chosen board game that they put out, uh, things like that. So if that's the case and it's just like, we know what Warcry is now. And so this is what it is. Then you might have hope that your war bands are not necessarily going to go away every single time. But if the other option is that, all of these keep going, right? If in another three years they start cutting and they just cut two thirds of the Warcry 2.0 warbands, I would say that is not a sustainable future for the game. Uh, at the same time, it's obviously not a sustainable future if they just keep releasing brand new warbands for every faction, every edition of Warcry, and by three or four editions, we just we get back to the situation that Slaves to Darkness was in, where every faction has four warbands in it. Obviously, they can't do that either. So that's why I think it would be really nice to have a little bit of clarification, a little bit of a, um, let's say, like, roadmap maybe. You know, I was kind of surprised that we didn't get a new roadmap when at Adepticon they filled out the last one. Uh, and so if you want that, tweet at them, uh, email the FAQ. Uh, I will put that on screen, the FAQ email. Um, let them know that you are interested because I think this stuff is really important and we are facing somewhat of a you know consumer confidence issue. Uh, obviously, Warcry is going to be around for a long time, but what is the shape of it? Why would I ever buy a Warcry Warband to play with when... Obviously, you're committed to the AOS miniatures more than you're committed to the Warcry ones, so why wouldn't I just play Warcry with only AOS? Um, these are legitimate questions that I think that they really need to clarify. This also brought up uh, some issues of, like, how bad does it feel for sort of different sorts of models to get, to get got, essentially? Because to me... Sacrosanct fighters are only six years old. It seems absurd that they got rid of them. Now, I get that the Stormcast range is a mess and that there were currently two entirely different Stormcast paradigms. Uh, so I have, this guy's not Sacrosanct, but I've got my Lord Castellant and my Knight Relictor here. Uh, and they just like, they don't even look like they're in the same, <laughs> like they just, com they look completely different, right? Um, so I get that there is just like that Stormcast had already essentially been totally revamped. The first group of Stormcast, Fatcast, was just not popular. Um, I actually think the Fatcast heroes look amazing, but the uh, Fatcast line troops um, look pretty bad. So there's still, it's going to be easy to proxy them, for example. Like this Sequitur is just super easy to just be a liberator but it still feels really absurd to have gotten rid of them that early uh and five years for the warcry warbands feels even worse right the question is like where is the line uh for me nine years for these warrior chamber heroes feels just fine i mean this guy's sculpt still holds up but a lot of them don't um and i don't know why that three-year gap feels important to me I think in general, if you told me most models only had a nine-year life expectancy, I would say that that's a little too short. Uh, but I'm still not sort of shocked by it either. Uh, people joke about how some models are old enough to drive. And so clearly there is a line somewhere. Um, a big part of it should be whether it still holds up. 
there's more to it than just time, but I think it's a really worthwhile thing to think about. Is And I'd love to hear people's ideas in the comments because I don't really have personally a great answer for this. I also wanted to think about maybe some uh, of the more cynical reasons, you know, why this happens. For the most part, I do think that this is for the health of AOS as a game. I don't think this is just a sales thing. Uh, but I wanted to look at how popular the squatted factions were. Tournament attendance and sales are two really different things. And also, a huge percentage of the sales of Warcry Warbands is AOS players. Um, I think, you know, you'd be surprised at what percentage of AOS purchases are Warcry players, too. Uh you know, just based on seeing the size of the community, people say that nobody plays Warcry, but then you go to Adepticon, Warcry was actually a pretty significant percentage of the people who were there for the Mortal Realms. Um, you know, not 50%, not even a third, right? But 15% is still a big enough percent that you can't ignore it. And it was probably bigger than 15. You know, it was probably more like one in five. Um, so... Again, tourney attendance and sales, two very different things, but uh, 242 players brought one of the squatted factions, a combined 18% of the metagame, so not a ton, but a real chunk, which I think is why this feels like such an apocalypse for, for Warcry players. Uh, I, you know, Being decimated is taking one-tenth of your group away, and it's considered like a horrible, drastic, uh, like, oh my god, how could this have happened thing? And uh, Decimated is way less than what just happened. Um, and it seems like really four of these are going to be majorly missed. I mean, Horns of Hushut were not popular until people started realizing that they were one of the best tournament factions. And then people started kind of begrudgingly painting them. Uh, but the other three, Iron Golems, Beasts of Chaos, and Untamed Beasts, were legitimately beloved and played by lots of people. Um, you know, Iron Golems had 41 player entries at tournaments. Uh, Untamed Beast had 33. Uh, Beast of Chaos had 36. Those are a lot, especially when you consider that those factions aren't particularly good. Uh, Iron Golems and Beast of Chaos were at least pretty good. I mean, sitting at 53 and 54% win rates. But Untamed Beast was bad. Like, just bad. And... <laughs> And people loved them. So many people brought Untamed Beasts, despite the fact that they were just, like, not good. I mean, more than not. Like, 43 is really, really low. Um, but people loved them and brought them anyway. And that's tough, man. I, I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat it, right? I think that Warcry is in a great place going forward, but this is pretty wild. And so I think that's really too bad. The one nice thing, you know, if you do love Untamed Beasts, I think they proxy very well for Darko Savagers. Uh, for example, my Darko Savager leader, my Slaughterborn, was built with a sword uh, because I built him in first edition when the sword was way better than anything else. But in the current edition of Warcry, the axe is way better. Luckily, I have this little Untamed Beast guy who is my Untamed Beast leader. I can't remember what his name is, the Heart Eater, but he's got an axe. Look at that thing. So you can always proxy these guys. I am absolutely going to be proxying my Untamed Beasts as Darko Savagers, essentially starting today, um, <laughs> because that's essentially what they're telling me to do. Not all of these proxy perfectly, um, but... A lot of them do. I think like iron golems are tough because they're really heavily armored. So you kind of want to proxy them for uh, slaves to darkness, but only about half of them are big enough to proxy for slaves to darkness because chaos warriors are like swollen chaos blessed humans. They're bigger than regular rank and file. And so, you know, like iron legionaries don't really fit there. Um, but I really hope that people sort of embrace the idea of using these as proxies. Corvus Cabal can be any kind of zinch, even though when you read their lore, they're clearly Nurgle. Uh, but in terms of their looks, they look like anything in zinch, and you can absolutely proxy them like that. Uh, Unmade can easily proxy into anything slanesh based. Um, I would, man, I still want to see like slanesh bottom of the barrel melee troops 
because uh, that would be what you could really proxy the unmade as really easily. Um, but you know we don't have that yet. But like the unmade leader can easily be any Slanesh hero, just super easy because he's really big and impressive. So he could work for that perfectly. Um, a lot of these have really cool proxy opportunities that I am looking forward to seeing what people do with them. Um, but again, that reckoning isn't coming for at least a year and a little bit. Uh, for the rest of second edition, you can absolutely play them. And I hope people give these a try before they go away if you've owned them and they've been on your shelf for a while. Um, I'll certainly try to play either Iron Golems or Untamed Beasts at a tournament at some point. Those are the ones of this group that I have. I also have Sacrosanct. I'm very sad about my my poor Thundercats going away. I love these guys. But I've uh, gotten to play them a whole bunch. I've played them at two AOS tournaments, a couple Warcry tournaments. Um, I'll give them another go because, God, I still can't believe that they chose Vanguard over Sacrosanct. These look so much better than Palador's. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this, this turned into a ramble, but I think these are questions that are worth considering. And I think that, you know, this is truly an awful thing to have happen to you if you love Warcry. But I don't think, you know, the biggest knee-jerk reactions of this being a dead game or, um, you know, this meaning really bad things for future Warcry Warbands, I don't think we necessarily should jump to those conclusions. Uh, so I wanted to put this out quick. Uh, so I'll be back with normal non-emergency videos in the future. And until then, may all your roles be crits.